It looks like a playground for dogs, but it's art. I'm at the Documenta, where even dogs have their own sculpture park. It's a radical change of perspective. For the first time, the spotlight is not on human beings. Judy here seems to be more interested in doggy treats, though. My colleague and I are exploring Kassel by bike. We're determined to see as much as possible of the world's biggest exhibition of contemporary art in one day. 150 artworks are spread out all over the city. Most of them are in Kazawa Park. Visitors often become part of the pieces. I end up in the sanatorium. It offers 15 different types of treatment. I have a go at anger management therapy. The Documenta 13 is not just a show, it's a laboratory. It tries to stretch the boundaries of art. The sanatorium was conceived by Mexican artist Pedro Reyes. The therapists are art students who have been specially trained for the occasion. But can art really create a better society? Or is it just a pleasant dream? I haven't seen ever a handmade chest. Oh, this is amazing. I would not call it utopia because utopia means that it doesn't exist and I'm very interested in producing things that are possible. So I even think this could be a model that could be replicated almost like a franchise around the world and not necessarily to take place inside the art world. That gives us something to ponder on the way to the next piece. We wonder what the documenta is trying to tell us while we're scratching our heads. We end up surrounded by vegetables. The Swiss chard barges are floating gardens containing 60 different varieties of the vegetable. The living sculpture was created by Swiss artist Christian Philipp Müller. Even plants have their own space at the Documenta. Müller says he's interested in moments of control, chaos and letting go. The principle of things being organized contrasted with uncontrolled growth. Many visitors just wander past without realizing that you are allowed to eat it. So this is what art tastes like. Not bad. The Documenta wants to break down the boundaries between nature, art and science. Müller says artists and scientists alike are tackling the burning questions of our time. One of the questions, he says, concerns ecology and the condition of the planet. In the middle of the park, a Japanese artist has built a witch's house out of bits and bombs found on the beach, the flotsam and jetsam of our consumer society. It's extremely surreal but visitors seem to like it. Well, I like it very much because it's a beautiful park and uh, it's much less crowded here than in the other buildings. And, um, well, this piece is really great. So, uh, yeah, that's yeah, it's a good idea. And this is even more surreal, a stone that has somehow ended up in a tree. To reach the next piece of art, we have to head off the main path. It's a sculpture of a woman with an unusual looking head. Artist Pierre Uyg has covered it with a beehive. The bees pollinate plants that are said to have aphrodisiacal qualities. The marshy environment is full of things growing, decomposing, living and dying. Behind a pile of compost, I find another dog. Human the Greyhound is guarding the woman with the beehive head. He and his owner are living here in the thicket as part of the sculpture. The shy animal has already become a Documenta icon. And this is even more disturbing. A platform made up of reconstructions of gallows used in notable executions. A 
critical stab at the death penalty. This installation recreates a tsunami in miniature. For some reason, it's surrounded by barley. The documenta is alive. Everywhere, things are growing and blossoming. This hill is made of kitchen waste. It's called doing nothing, and it's by Chinese artist Song Dong. There are various plants growing on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly, nobody seems to question whether it's really art. This man says he doesn't know whether it was intentionally planted or not. I tell him it used to be garden waste. He can see it now, he says. There are probably all kinds of things in it. This woman says if there's rubbish underneath with things growing on it, that's definitely art, as life changes things. It's time for a break. We relax in some hammocks and plan the rest of our day. It's clear that we'll only be able to see a fraction of what's on offer in the available time. So where shall we go next? We choose the Huguenot House in the city center. The empty house has been remodeled by a group of unemployed Americans using material from old buildings. Artist Theaster Gates has brought some friends from Chicago with him to Castle to help with the project. They'll be living in the house during the 100 days of the Documenta. There's plenty to keep them and their visitors entertained. To us guests, it all seems a bit bizarre. Nick Baker from Chicago seems quite happy to have strangers sniffing around his kitchen. I don't really think that I'm alone, just part of the exhibition, it's just everyone is part of the exhibition. This whole building is an exhibition, so when you come into the place, you're part of the art too. So the exchange of conversation, culture and everything, it's just the whole, the whole piece. We head back outdoors to a butterfly garden that looks like an Albrecht Dürer painting. It's been planted by artist and biologist Christina Buch. Every day she releases hand-bred butterflies here. The recent rain and wind have dispersed the insects, so you'll be lucky to spot one at the moment. Buch likes the lack of predictability. She says she likes playing with the way human beings look at nature. Instead of it being on the ground, she says, we are confronted by it. We find ourselves face to face with a thistle or stinging nettle, a butterfly or a dragonfly and they're allowed to feel at home here on the island. Buch says it takes us back to being children again. We no longer find ourselves towering above these things. Just meters away, things are getting political. The Occupy movement has taken over the square in front of the Documenta's main exhibition venue, the Friderizianum. The activists have brought their own art with them. It's highly critical of unbridled capitalism. The documenta's director was so impressed, she integrated the squatters into the exhibition. Some critics say the protesters have sold out. But they say they have their own agenda. This protester says they want to motivate people not to just stay at home during the next elections, but to get involved. He says freedom and democracy have to be fought for. Our next stop is the Kulturbahnhof, a former train station that's been turned into a cultural center. We join a so-called detour. These involve amateurs giving visitors their take on the exhibits. The guides are called worldly companions. Ours is management consultant Jens Tumza. He introduces us to a sound installation on the platform. 
During the Nazi era, Jews were deported to Auschwitz from here. Now visitors can hear fragments of the Study for String Orchestra. It was composed in Theresienstadt concentration camp and performed there by inmates. The Kulturbahnhof is one of the documenta's highlights. Tumsa talks about art in a refreshingly different way, making it twice as much fun. The worldly companion tours are also conducted by foresters and doctors. Tumsa says that reflects the idea that as well as artists, scientists and historians are part of the documenta too. It's about getting another angle on things, he says, a different perspective on developments in society and art. It's getting late. We take a quick look at the offerings of South African artist William Kentridge, one of the documenta's stars. His video installation is about time. One day is much too little to really delve into this unique artistic universe full of dogs, bees and vegetables. It's the most radically different documenta we've ever experienced, and also the most humorous, sensual and visionary.